both Karls and crinoids temporarily appeared in larger numbers than heretofore, but the ammonites dominated the invertebrate life of the oceans, their average size ranging from three to four inches, though one species attained a diameter of eight feet. Sponges were everywhere, and both cuttlefish and oysters continued to evolve. 110 million years ago, the potentials of marine life were continuing to unfold. The sea urchin was one of the outstanding mutations of this epoch. Crabs, lobsters, and the modern types of crustaceans matured. Marked changes occurred in the fish family, a sturgeon type first appearing, but the ferocious sea serpents, descended from the land reptiles, still infested all the seas, and they threatened the destruction of the entire fish family. This continued to be, preeminently, the age of the dinosaurs. They so overran the land that two species had taken to the water for sustenance during the preceding period of sea encroachment. These sea serpents represent a backward step in evolution. While some new species are progressing, certain strains remain stationary and others gravitate backward, reverting to a former state. And this is what happened when these two types of reptiles forsook the land. As time passed, the sea serpents grew to such size that they became very sluggish and eventually perished because they did not have brains large enough to afford protection for their immense bodies. Their brains weighed less than two ounces, notwithstanding the fact that these huge ichthyosaurs sometimes grew to be fifty feet long, the majority being over thirty-five feet in length. The marine crocodilians were also a reversion from the land type of reptile, but unlike the sea serpents, these animals always returned to the land to lay their eggs. Soon after two species of dinosaurs migrated to the water in a futile attempt at self-preservation, two other types were driven to the air by the bitter competition of life on land. But these flying pterosaurs were not the ancestors of the true birds of subsequent ages. They evolved from the hollow-boned leaping dinosaurs and their wings were of bat-like formation, with a spread of twenty to twenty-five feet. These ancient flying reptiles grew to be ten feet long, and they had separable jaws, much like those of modern snakes. For a time these flying reptiles appeared to be a success, but they failed to evolve along lines which would enable them to survive as air navigators. They represent the non-surviving strains of bird ancestry. Turtles increased during this period, first appearing in North America. Their ancestors came over from Asia by way of the northern land bridge. One hundred million years ago, the reptilian age was drawing to a close. The dinosaurs, for all their enormous mass, were all but brainless animals, lacking the intelligence to provide sufficient food to nourish such enormous bodies. And so did these sluggish land reptiles perish in ever-increasing numbers. Henceforth, evolution will follow the growth of brains, not physical bulk, and the development of brains will characterize each succeeding epoch of animal evolution and planetary progress. This period, embracing the height and the beginning decline of the reptiles, extended nearly 25 million years and is known as the Jurassic. 3. The Cretaceous Stage, the Flowering Plant Period the age of birds. The Great Cretaceous Period derives its name from the predominance of the prolific chalk-making foraminifers in the seas. This period brings Urantia to near the end of the long reptilian dominance and witnesses the appearance of flowering plants and bird life on land. These are also the times of the termination of the westward and southward drift of the continents accompanied by tremendous crustal deformations and concomitant widespread lava flows and great volcanic activities. Near the close of the preceding geologic period, much of the continental land was up above water, although as yet there were no mountain peaks. But as the continental land drift continued, it met with the first great obstruction on the deep floor of the Pacific. This contention of geologic forces gave impetus to the formation of the whole vast north and south mountain range extending from Alaska down through Mexico to Cape Horn. This period thus becomes the modern mountain-building stage of geologic history. Prior to this time, there were few mountain peaks, merely elevated land ridges of great width. 
Now the Pacific Coast Range was beginning to elevate, but it was located 700 miles west of the present shoreline. The Sierras were beginning to form, their gold-bearing quartz strata being the product of lava flows of this epoch. In the eastern part of North America, Atlantic sea pressure was also working to cause land elevation. 100 million years ago, the North American continent and a part of Europe were well above water. The warping of the American continents continued, resulting in the metamorphosing of the South American Andes and in the gradual elevation of the western plains of North America. Most of Mexico sank beneath the sea, and the southern Atlantic encroached on the eastern coast of South America, eventually reaching the present shoreline. The Atlantic and Indian Oceans were then about as they are today. Ninety-five million years ago, the American and European land masses again began to sink. The southern seas commenced the invasion of North America and gradually extended northward to connect with the Arctic Ocean, constituting the second greatest submergence of the continent. When this sea finally withdrew, it left the continent about as it now is. Before this great submergence began, the eastern Appalachian highlands had been almost completely worn down to the water's level. The many colored layers of pure clay now used for the manufacture of earthenware were laid down over the Atlantic coast regions during this age, their average thickness being about 2,000 feet. Great volcanic actions occurred south of the Alps and along the line of the present California Coast Range mountains. The greatest crustal deformations in millions upon millions of years took place in Mexico. Great changes also occurred in Europe, Russia, Japan, and southern South America. The climate became increasingly diversified. Ninety million years ago, the angiosperms emerged from these early Cretaceous seas and soon overran the continents. These land plants suddenly appeared along with fig trees, magnolias, and tulip trees. Soon after this time, fig trees, breadfruit trees, and palms overspread Europe and the western plains of North America. No new land animals appeared. Eighty-five million years ago, Bering Strait closed, shutting off the cooling waters of the northern seas. Theretofore, the marine life of the Atlantic Gulf waters and that of the Pacific Ocean had differed greatly owing to the temperature variations of these two bodies of water, which now became uniform. The deposits of chalk and green sand marl give name to this period. The sedimentations of these times are variegated, consisting of chalk, shale, sandstone, and small amounts of limestone, together with inferior coal, or lignite, and in many regions they contain oil. These layers vary in thickness from 200 feet in some places to 10,000 feet in western North America and numerous European localities. Along the eastern borders of the Rocky Mountains, these deposits may be observed in the uptilted foothills. All over the world, these strata are permeated with chalk, and these layers of porous semi-rock pick up water at upturned outcrops and convey it downward to furnish the water supply of much of the Earth's present arid regions. Eighty million years ago, great disturbances occurred in the Earth's crust. The western advance of the continental drift was coming to a standstill, and the enormous energy of the sluggish momentum of the intercontinental mass upcrumpled the Pacific shoreline of both North and South America and initiated profound repercussional changes along the Pacific shores of Asia. This circumpacific land elevation, which culminated in present-day mountain ranges, is more than 25,000 miles long, and the upheavals attendant upon its birth were the greatest surface distortions to take place since life appeared on Urantia. The lava flows, both above and below ground, were extensive and widespread. Seventy-five million years ago marks the end of the continental drift. From Alaska to Cape Horn, the long Pacific Coast mountain ranges were completed, but there were as yet few peaks. The back thrust of the halted continental drift continued the elevation of the western plains of North America, while in the east the worn-down Appalachian mountains of the Atlantic coast region were projected straight up with little or no tilting. Seventy million years